Hello, everyone. Welcome to Loving Life Conversation Series, People Who Change the World. Today, we have Paul Marka, who's the CEO of Parallax Global Advisors. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. So you were at Stanford for 36 years, as you said. So you know a lot about education, and your company now is focusing on the future of education and the future of work. So what does that mean, future of education, future of work? Well, so <clears throat> when I was uh, back in college, you'd get a job, you graduate, and you maybe work for a company for 20, 30, maybe 40 years, and you would have a nice retirement, you'd maybe get a watch, and then you'd ride off into the sunset. Um, a couple of things have changed since I graduated many, many years ago. Uh, first, um, if for today's working professional graduating from college, he or she will have five to seven completely different careers. So the future of work is about uh, being able to learn and adapt and grow while you're on the job. But you can't do that without education. So I see a connection between the future of work, where you're moving and changing careers, and the future of learning, where the learning has to be flexible. It has to grow with you. A lifelong learning is, is the key message that I talk about. Lifelong learning, yes. You know, when we're casually chatting, one of my friends who has a corporate job, she recently started taking computer science master degree, and you are an expert of creating education program, especially for adults after they enter the workforce, and then you have built global partnership with UAE, with China, with France, with Cambodia, with Thailand. What was the secret sauce of building the global partnerships? Yeah, so, so global partnerships, so I think, first of all, uh, organizations today have to be really good at partnering, whether it's partnering uh, to support employees in their growth and learning or partnering externally. Um, I would say one of the things that we talked about at Stanford as we partnered was um, we had, when we have at Stanford, amazing content. Faculty members are world class. But what's missing often when you go global is the context. And context takes many forms. One, the target audience. What do they know? What context do they bring to the table? Two, what is the cultural context? It's not just about what you know or what you don't know, but rather, how will it work? I'll, I'll give you an example. We, we spent a lot of time in China delivering transformation and innovation. But the, the word for innovation is, is not exactly clear. It wasn't translated clearly initially for us so that the learners in China could understand. So it's, it's both about what they know, how do we convey that, but also a little bit about the context and how we deliver that uh, in a particular culture. So innovation, xin, the word wasn't, it wasn't easily translated That's right. into Chinese. That's right. Very interesting. Were you partnering with a Chinese institution? How did you do it? So in China in particular, we worked, um, we started, my first trip to China was 2006, and there were more, in Tiananmen Square, there were more bikes than cars. <laughs> the last time I visited China in 2019, there were many, many more cars, and the bikes were zooming by because of the traffic. Um, we began uh, our work in, in 2006, and what we found was there were um, actually government entities that we were working with that were keen on learning about transformation. And so, in, in particular, in the Jiangsu province, uh, Nanjing, uh, there, there are many towns and, and cities in, in the south that were really keen on uh, learning about innovation, uh, it, the the, uh, the five-year plans successively always had a reference to innovation, and so it became a, a pretty strong mandate. And this is when we began, the language and the terms weren't clear. I think when we, we finished, I think pr everybody has a pretty good idea of the various dimensions of innovation. So really, the Chinese government, you mentioned Jiangsu, Nanjing, the southern part, are actually advocates for this type of learning, this type of innovation. So you were able to get the backing from the government. That's right. And then we, we went from the government to, to enterprises. And, and it was really, it, we had a, a really great uh, run there where we had executive groups coming to Stanford, taking education. We would go there and visit. We'd have alumni gatherings. It was really uh, quite a spectacular uh, experience. And again, it was about the content, but it was also about understanding what cases, how <clears throat> professionals and, 
and government officials were using the content to make an impact. One quick example, in, in the city of Nanjing, uh, they were really interested in, in seeing a jail here and learning about the recycling programs. And suddenly, um, we, they, they, they were able to take, in only the way that Chinese can move very quickly, take everything that they learned about the recycling programs here and put it in place in, in Nanjing. <laughs> Very fast learners. Indeed. Yes, Indeed. yes. When you were describing your experience in China, I can feel that you really understand the context. What is it that the other part needs? I feel that's a special skill you have when you launch these global partnerships. It's really about understanding what the other part one with the deep understanding of what Stanford has to offer. How did you learn that skill? Was it natural for you? And ha have you always have that skill? So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a good question. I think it's a little bit about personality. It's a little bit about training. So I was, uh, when I was at Stanford here, I was trained as a communication major. I was, um, pr in high school, I used to write for the newspaper. And, you know, newspaper uh, writing is a great uh, training ground for really trying to funnel the ideas. You're getting to the point very, very quickly, right? And so I, I think, um, in, and then be, being a television producer, you have very few minutes to create an impact. Like between 30 seconds and three minutes, you have to make an impact with a view or otherwise they're off to the next uh, video. So um, part of that is, is understanding and reading the audience. Part of it is also, as you rightly mentioned, uh, understanding what, what it is we're delivering and how we're delivering it. Um, one, one, one example, so we do a lot of work in innovation and entrepreneurship here at Stanford and continue to, to deliver that. Um, one of the things that we've observed around the globe is some people have a good understanding about innovation, how to create a great idea, but not how to, in, to, uh, to deliver that idea to market. That's entrepreneurship. And what we started to teach was that's two sides of the same coin. Innovation on one side, entrepreneurship on the other. They have to go together. But it's often not the same person doing the innovating or doing the entrepreneurship. So that's, a, that's also a common myth that, that, that we learned. And reading the various culture and what we could deliver was really important. So you were talking about innovation and entrepreneurship. And to you, if I get it right, innovation is about the idea of innovation, about inventing new things. And entrepreneurship is the execution That's of correct. that innovation. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and how do you teach that? Because I think part of the reason why Stanford University is such a unique place is it really gives people that spirit, that entrepreneurship with the real knowledge of how to do things. So, so I think Stanford. So, in thinking about innovations, it's a little bit about um, discovery, creating new knowledge. That's what a university does. Um, it's often the case, though, that many of those great ideas sit on the shelf at, at many universities. Um, and what what Stanford is pretty good at is is activating those ideas and bringing them to market. Um, we do that in a couple of different ways. First, um, faculty members found their own businesses. Mm -hmm. And there's capital in the Silicon Valley to take some money and create an idea and, and see if they can make a go of it. The, the second um, pathway is through Office of Technology Licensing at Stanford, where they take the, the idea and then they put it on a platform and they share that, that idea across the platform for anybody who would like to view it or license it in, in particular areas of interest. And, and the third way we do this is, is not just faculty, but students might hear an idea and make that, uh, take that and, and be, be, rather than invent the idea, it's already here, how can students take that and actually create a business around it with and potentially for the faculty who, who are creating the great idea. Faculty have their own, their own great jobs. They may not want to, uh, to jump out and, and become an entrepreneur. They, they may just want to create the intellectual property for the idea. So basically, there are different ways of launching that. It's faculty starting their own business or sharing on the platform or even students taking those ideas and run with them. When we met, it was because I was mentoring for this great program you have created, um, Stanford Lille Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program. And 
I thought the program did such a good job because there are different modules where entrepreneurs can express their idea, presentation, they can listen to faculty, they have office hours, and they have discussions. When you decide you're going to launch a program with so-and-so, how do you craft that initial education program? What are the elements you have to put into it? What's the process of creating the product that you have created many, many times? Um, when we create product, um, education product, a couple of important things, uh, back to the journalism, sort of know your audience. What's your target audience? Where are they today? And where would you like to move them tomorrow? So then, then the intervention is an education experience or learning journey, as we call it, where we think about um, how we're trying to convey some knowledge and allowing for practice. One of the things we did in the LEO program is actually have these guys pitch all the time or and gals, I should say. And so, and then recording that, because then you can see yourself. The worst thing for some people is to look at themselves on video. The best thing for an entrepreneur is to look at themselves on video, because they can get a very good sense of how they convey their message. And it's so important in a very crowded marketplace of ideas and, and companies that you, if you have a shot at creating uh, an impact with a, a, v, a venture capitalist or someone who's going to fund, that you deliver the message on point and on target. So one of the things that we're trying to do in the LEO program is, is have these guys have eight to ten slides that will uh, allow them to pitch their idea in a very concise and effective way. And, and so that's the outcome that we're seeking. We hope that over time they will get better at that. They will also pivot and create companies that will drive jobs in the Lille Nord region, potentially have cr and create uh, huge uh, successful international companies as well. But I think the goal for us is to get, get these guys better so that they can get some funding to explore their idea. So you really know your audience and you have a special way to, to help your entrepreneurs become you know, build better companies, essentially. I like one, th one thing that you said, which is about learning on a job, which is about practicing, which is about, you know, even recording your pitch and getting better and better and better. In your research, in your field of the future of work, do you see that happening more and more, learning on a job? Or do you see, you know, it's still the traditional training and then, and then go... I think, so, so one of the things, I would say that higher education is under pressure. Um, in the past, we went to school for the first, uh, let's just say, 24 years of our life. From, from the age of four to the age of 24, if you got a PhD, you're in school. And it's front-loaded activity. And then often you would graduate and get a job and work for 20 to 30 years. A couple of things have happened. Um, for, first, in my job at higher ed in higher education, um, so while I was working while I was working at Stanford, um, what I saw was a shift in the higher education mandate. And my job was to think about, uh, I would say, sort of postgraduate education, whether it's a MOOC to get people smarter, whether it's a graduate degree to complement an existing degree, or whether it's professional and executive education of the sort that we did with the top 500, that great team. Um, in each of those scenarios, uh, you could come back to school or the school comes to you in, in short bursts of critical knowledge that would benefit you as a, as a working professional. One of the things that, that re the reason I think higher education is under pressure is because they, they, they sort of, you know, four to eight and done. I, I think as much as I paid to go to Stanford many years ago, I think Stanford should probably offer me an insurance policy against my own obsolescence. My ideas, my knowledge is going to old and die. I may get better on the job, but what happens when I need Stanford to come and help me out to get a new job? You know, that's the kind of thing I think Stanford should have on-ramps and off-ramps for people like me who need to get better, who need a new job. One of the things that I was involved with at the D School was thinking about education, and, and I, they have uh, this, this great website, and one of the things that we explored was um, sort of the, the what's the education going to be like in 2025? Well, guess what? We're here. But the, one of the concepts was, was um, the open loop university, that's creating on-ramps and off-ramps. Maybe you take two years of university, you go out and work, and you come back and you finish your degree with some working knowledge. I think something like that, Stanford and other universities, especially who have the wherewithal, 
maybe have a moral obligation to think about this lifelong learning opportunity. It's no longer the four or eight year degree. It's got to be the 60 or 70 year degree because we're living longer. We want to be engaged for a longer period of time. And, and that's, I think, the opportunity that I see. That's what I talk about with the future of work and the future of learning. We're living longer. We're going to have more jobs. We better be learning longer as well. Yes. So to, to learn longer, to map with the working longer, so it's, it's a synergy. I was talking with Ashmeet Sidana, who's an investor in the Valley, and then he told me a quote of his second grade school teacher. Education is the process from womb to tomb. So every single second we live, we're learning. And, you know, the other day I was playing with my son and then he doesn't really want to go to school. And then I asked him, oh, what do you want to do? He said, play. And I feel that is the essence of learning because when you make it fun, then people want to learn. And also work, when you make work fun, when you make work enjoyable, people want to work. So I could also see a potential synergy between the, worker, the future of education and the future of work to make it more enjoyable. Because when I attended the Stanford program with VC and Long, it was enjoyable for me. So how do you put that element into the education? Yeah, I, mean, I think, so you may talk about enjoyable. I think about relevance. And, and uh, we, we talk about action-based learning. So when we're designing programs, I'm thinking about, you know, what, what are the things that we can do to activate that learning uh, experience, to make it really relevant and memorable? And it may not be listening to a lecture. It may be um, flipping the, the model and allowing and affording the students to present to each other, to, to work an idea, um, rather than give a lecture, what if you gave a seed of an idea and have the table talk about it and synthesize their collective knowledge and present it back to the class, for example? So this is a technique that we've often used in, in many of the programs that we designed for working professionals, who many of whom have far more experience than you, than you or I have. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be great to learn from them while, while you've got them in the room? So it's collective learning and collective teaching at the same time. That's right. You're trying to build a learning community. And, and I think, you know, in the best case, uh, we did a lot of work in the Lille Nord region. Uh, and that program we started, uh, and you were involved in, in coaching for that, um, we started that program in 2009, in the middle of that downturn. We kicked it off in 2010. And the program is still running today with lots of graduates and literally thousands of jobs and, and millions upon millions of euros raised in capital for the companies that we engaged. But what's more important than that is we created a language and a community in Lille um, that, that appreciates the notion of innovation, how to create an, and, uh, a great idea and entrepreneurship and how to take that idea and make it a company or a viable uh, opportunity. And, and I think that common language with perspective around go-to-market opportunities and the way you act and behave as a startup and, and as a company, um, th this is the kind of legacy that, that we have left behind there. Yes, and the startup entrepreneurship are really the driving engine for moving society, moving our economy forward. So you were at Stanford for 36 years, and now you ran Parallax Global Advisor, focused on the future of work, future of education. How did you get started as an entrepreneur yourself? <laughs> Well, so I had the privilege at Stanford of running uh, a, a team uh, of 80 people, and we, we generated millions of dollars back to Stanford University every year uh, for the work that we did. And so I would say that I was, Stanford was a great proving ground for learning about how to be an entrepreneur. And in fact, you might argue that running a business, which we did inside of Stanford, is perhaps more difficult than running it outside. Um, we, we learned a lot. I've had the, the, the good fortune also of creating lots of connections around the globe, many of whom are now my clients. And, and in fact, one of my good friends uh, at Stanford, I, I belong to the International Association for Continuing Engineering Education, IACEE. One of my good friends is uh, Wang Chung. Um, and he and I now partner to, to drive something called DT School in China, where we're doing exactly uh, what I shared with you earlier, which is we took some, some design thinking and designing your life content. We're translating it into Chinese. We have uh, Wang Chung and his team at the DT School are contextualizing that content. And we're delivering train the trainer models, the goal, the goal of which would be to, to scale this content across China with 
coaches who are qualified to deliver the content and, and also uh, create a great learning experience, one that will be memorable for the students that we engage. So it's just another example where I have all these great friends that I made at Stanford. I maintain those relationships. And, and now as an entrepreneur, I'm able to benefit both psychically, we, with Jibong Chung, I love the guy, he's a fantastic guy, and uh, also hopefully economically, over time we, we will be cross fingers ma making good, good revenues and, and making an impact in China. So it was very organic for you. You have this relationship and then you work together. You collaborate to build a business together. I want to learn more about the design, the DT thinking in China. You recommend this book for me, uh, which I bought actually. What was the essence of the DT thinking in China? Yeah, so I think um, one of the things that we saw when, in my travels in China is, is in China, also in Korea. We went there, we presented design thinking. Give me the definition of design, give me the de definition of management, and then uh, I will figure that, that once you give me the definition, then I can plug in the formula and it'll all ma magically you know, come to fruition. <laughs> it's not that simple. Um, one of the things that, that China is excellent at is creating engineers who can answer questions mm. from the formula. One of the things that they're less good at is actually ideating in a way that is amb that, that appreciates ambiguity and and in, in in the evolution of this product it's taking a little bit of time because one of the things that Wang Chung and his team are struggling with is the material that we're delivering doesn't have the answer it provides the opportunity to ask really good questions about your customers about your product and your service and you need to develop the answers and that's really interesting it's it's the difference between learning how to do and learning how to learn and and I think what we're trying to do is is do the do the latter learning how to learn asking the right questions is is often challenging and the thing we're trying to teach and it's it's tricky it's a struggle learning how to learn it's like teaching people to fish instead of giving them fish directly that's right yeah except that the fish is a formula you simply take the hook, you put it in the water, and then you, you bait it. And if you have the right bait, you'll get the fish. What we're saying is, actually, what if fishing is not possible? How can you, what, what's next? What's, what, what's, what are the other opportunities that might be available to you for your, in the case of designing your life, for your life, uh, for your work in designing your work life, and also thinking about design thinking, how do you create optionality for the customers that you already have. How do you engage with those customers by deep customer empathy, design thinking, to, to create um, new and different business models so that your company can remain viable, not just now, but in the future? So th these are, these questions, it's not just co copy, paste, repeat. It, it's, it's really starting to think more, much more broadly about um, about the opportunity set for you as a person and also for the future of a company. Yeah, it's less about the teacher says A plus B equals C, so this formula is about learning how to learn. What do you want to learn? Here are different options. You can, you can really require, you reuse this more of the student to actually move forward to empower them. You mentioned the word design thinking multiple times. What is design thinking? Ah, you see, now that's, that's a formula question. I don't know if I can answer. <laughs> but let me, let me try. I, I would use design thinking and innovation uh, synonymously. So design thinking is a set of concepts that um, really sort of explore the, the, I'll call it the innovation space. In, in the way that Stanford defines it, <clears throat> design thinking is really using empathy to define a problem space or problem area. Once you've identified the problem space or problem area, um, then you can start to ideate around potential solutions for that problem space. You can test those ideas with your customer, uh, prototype and then test. So uh, once again, you know, you have to, you, empathize, define the problem, ideate, prototype, and test. Those are the sort of five core principles of design thinking. Empathize. Empathize first. Most, most engineers go right to the ideate. I see a problem. Let me just ideate. Yes. But you might be solving the wrong problem. 
especially if you have a lot of engineers in the room. You'll solve the problem, but you may be solving the wrong problem. A lot of, a lot of what, um, what's missing in China and in other places, frankly, also here in the U.S., is asking the question of the customer. People just don't do that. They don't ask questions about what customers want. And customers don't often have a crisp answer. Right. So I don't know. I just don't like it. Well, say more about that. What don't you like? And so this is the pathway to find you have to keep asking questions. Why don't you like it? What is it about the service? And then you have to, people often say the customer is always right. Actually, no. <laughs> the customer has insight, but only if you, as the producer of the product or service, are willing to extract that insight. You have to be persistent. And then you combine that with your own knowledge about your product or service, and then you might have something. So I, I think this, this notion of, of uh, the customer always right is, 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 is uh, something that I've tried to dispel in my various uh, places that I've been. <laughs> so you have to listen to the customers, listen to their insights, but then take it and integrate into producing the product that serves them. Right. And then you, and then you and again, design thinking. So empathize with the customer, ask them questions they don't know. Uh, then you start to define the problem space. What are the various alternatives? Then you ideate some ideas, and then you prototype and test it with them. So that's, that's sort of the do loop. You just keep doing that over and over and over again. I love that model a lot because it gives you a practical way to actually launch your product again and again and again. I want to dig in a bit more uh, on the empathy piece using going back to my fishing analogy because you have, you have to find you have to define what fish you want to fish first. But, well, okay, but but here, the, the, let me just take that fishing yes. analogy. You've solved the problem. The food is the but 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 it's a, the problem space is. Uh, sustaining a human body with through food, and and fishing is one pathway to that, mm. but it may not be the only pathway. Right. Uh, you may be a, a, a vegan, so then you have to look to. I mean, I think that's the point that I would that I would make about about design thinking. It's about identifying the problem space and then asking the customer. So, what do you like to eat? How ha what have you done before in your past experience? Where how are the how are the many ways that we can get you fed, you and your family fed? What are the practical barriers to that? And then trying to define that problem space so then you can ideate possible ideas. Well, let's think about possible solutions to the problem space that we've identified. So it's about opening up the question even. So this is a question but you, you solve on a, bit, on a higher level. You've got it exactly right. It's, it's really opening the lens and the filter, getting wider and wider, using empathy as that tool. Once you start to generate ideas, it's getting really wide. Um, a faculty member, Bob Sutton at Stanford D School, talked about um, a toy company. They created 2,000 ideas, 200 rough prototypes, 12 products, and two were commercially successful in one year. The point uh, that Bob makes and that I would make is that you have to have, when you ideate, define the problem space, ideate, you've got to have like, if you have two ideas, that's good, but you will fail. If you have 2,000 ideas, now we're talking. So how do, you, how do you start to generate lots and lots of ideas, even bad ideas, no idea is a bad idea, just get them, get them out there on the table. And we've done this in workshops many times where you have a group of five to ten people, you just throw them on an idea like tourism. You, you have maybe six tables. You can generate 300 ideas in five minutes with, with, with six tables of, of five people. No problem. And, and that's the kind of volume that you need in order to, to both have fun. But, but then, the, then the thing is you've got to prototype this. So you start to narrow the ideas, maybe parallel track three or four or five really good ideas. You prototype those, and then you, keep, then you test them, and then you do it again. What did the customer think? How did it react? How did they react? What, what are the things that we can do to narrow, narrow the focus? So that do loop starts to create a pathway to innovative ideas, but not companies. <laughs> That's just the idea. Then you've got to take that you know, idea and create a, a company opportunity service or product that will actually uh, materialize into something that's useful and interesting. It's like a sales funnel. You need to start with very, very many ideas and da, 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 you have idea. And then it's not even company yet. To share my insights about, you know, contextualize your product in China, I feel 
at least when I was growing up, it's very important to be right, to be always right. So even when I give out an idea, I tend to self-editing. You know, I might have 10 ideas, but oh, this is not good and not good. But I feel Stanford is very special in terms of giving a landscape of accepting all ideas. And you said no ideas are bad ideas. How do you cultivate that culture of no ideas are bad ideas? It's about giving people the security to share and without judging yourself. I, I, think, I think a couple of things. What, what one is that, um, you know, volume creates, if you just have one or two ideas and you're self-editing, you're, then you're, you're really limiting the opportunity. But if you have a bunch of ideas, you know many of them will be good, some of them will be bad, some of them will be okay, but you've got the volume to, to sort of provide air cover for you. I think volume is a great thing in this regard. <laughs> and, and, and I think, you know, one of the things in, in, in the Chinese mindset is, is really, I think, you know, I've got to be right, saving face. And, and I, I've actually, in my work in China, I've spun this a little bit. Rather than succeed or fail, test and fail, I've used Chinese medicine as a, as a metaphor for, for businesses. The Chinese have incredibly rich, 5,000 year history with Chinese medicine. It's the same thing with, you, you use a product, you observe the, and, and you learn. It's, it's observation and learning rather than failing. And so I, I think trying to just spin the model a little bit, it, it just simply become detached. It's not about success or failure or losing face, it's about learning. And, and if Chinese medicine can do it over 5,000 years, I, I have no doubt that the design thinking uh, and, and the volume associated with that will be successful in China when, when my friend, uh, we, when we launch our, our various products in, in China. So. so it's almost about redefining the dictionary. There's no failure or win or lose. It's just about learning. How do you become an entrepreneur in a corporate world? Or is it even possible? The reason why I ask, even when, you know, I started my career with BCG and, you know, work different careers, and I feel whenever a company looks for a special talent for a job, it tends to create a box. You know, you have to be a product manager, you are a software engineer, and that type of design thinking tend to have challenges reaching its maximized value because of all the surrounding environment. Yeah. Is it possible to be an entrepreneur? How can corporations do better? Yeah, I think, I, I, I think corporations are challenged in this regard. Some, some companies are, are thoughtful about engaging the famous Google 20%, right? I mean, Gmail came from that. Um, so the, the, Google set parameters around which engineers could operate and practice. There, there are other companies that are doing this as well. Uh, there's a company that we engaged here at Stanford called Danfoss. They have a man on the moon project. Maybe it should be man or woman on the moon project. And the, the, what they did was they created a, a platform for a, and a competition that was a pub, and, and if you got, if you won, if your project won, then you would get time to support the, the project. Um, a lot of companies uh, f don't the, entrepreneurship is on top of your existing work if you want to do something or entrepreneurship if you want to do something inside the company and and that creates a disincentive right because it's extra work and and so one of the things that that's a problem for companies is is many of those people will use the company to learn and then leave right and and so I think that then there's a talent all the best people will be potentially creating, taking their ideas and leaving. And, and that's, in fact, one of the reasons that Dan Foss created this Man on the Moon project. Their really bright engineers were getting frustrated because they had to fit in the box and they couldn't do cool stuff. And so they wanted cool stuff. And so the, some of them went out and started their own businesses. And Dan Foss talked about how do we keep those people inside uh, of our, our organization and allow them to flourish inside here. So it takes a little bit of a I would say, uh, enlightened corporate mindset to, to, to do this. And many companies are now starting to do this, right? Um, so there's a company that a woman named Linda Yates, a Stanford graduate, runs called Mach 49. They're, they're helping companies do this uh, entrepreneurship thing, or corporate entrepreneurship is, is what Pedro Mokrian uh, would, would call it. So it takes an enlightened corporate mindset to create a space 
for the best entrepreneurs to, to pursue their passion while working for the company. Yes, yes. So in your job as the CEO of um, Parallax Global Advisors, you have clients that you advise on, um, on strategy, on design thinking, on entrepreneurs. How, what's your relationship with your client? How do you advise them on what specific, what is the process of getting a client and helping develop a program for them? And it's global clients. Yeah, so I think there may be a bunch of different questions, questions there. Questions in one so, question. So, so one, how do I get clients? Well, per, per, it's really personal relationships. And the good news is now I'm in a position where I only want to work with people that I like. <laughs> so that's what I do. I mean, I, I, I sort of, I'm interviewing them as much as they may be interviewing yes. me f- to support their efforts. The second is I want to take interesting work, so selecting work that will be challenging and where I can contribute value, where I also um, believe that there's a learning opportunity for me as well. So, um, you know, I think th- then that builds, ideally, the, the relationship is relatively close. I, I, I'm a fairly senior guy. Uh, I have a good sense of how to get things done. I'm going to commit my time, and I have a couple of other partners that I work with. Um, we're going to commit our senior level time, uh, to, rather than having, say, uh, McKinsey, who has a junior sort of assistant coming in and doing a bunch of slide decks. The other thing that I'm trying to do is make an impact um, in the work that we do. I actually want to see things happen. Um, one of the clients that I have, a, a fairly good university, was seeking some advice and guidance around um, how to build extended education capacity. And so I, I helped build the plan for them. And, and I, you know, the, uh, the project was a 10 month pr- plan, project with the plan and so on. But I, I called them, you know, recently and, and said, hey, you know, how's it going? What's, what's happening? And the good news, things are happening. Uh, so the plan, you know, is viable and they were able to see the, the worthwhile uh, presentation that I gave and, and now they're making something happen. So that's the kind of impact that I hope to have and, and hopefully I'm building lo- lifelong friends uh, in and around the world. So that's, Yes, that's building lifelong goal. friends while building a sustainable business. I love what you said about making things happen. I feel you have a way of getting things done in the most frictionless way. Here's what I meant. You know, when we were scheduling this interview, the way you respond is always about getting to the next step, getting to the next step. And I'm, I'm the same way. So I love the efficiency. What is your secret of removing the friction of getting things done? So, so I, mean, I, I love the I love the phrase that you use, frictionless, and I think you're paying me an enormous compliment to say that that I actually I actually do that. I'm, I think I. I um, so a couple things. One, I have. I used to be a television producer and director, and that, I mean, we used to have to move. You know, it was really tough work to do the fun stuff. Um, Stanford Stadium had five flights of stairs. We had uh, equipment that was 500 pounds, and in order to get it up, we had to flip it over step by step in order to get the control unit up to the, the, the five flights of stairs that we needed. It was unbelievably difficult to get to the fun part, which is producing television. I, I have an appreciation for the amount of friction that there is in life, and I try to reduce it where I can. Um, one of the one of my secrets, I would say, is putting myself in the other person's shoes and thinking about how I can make his or her life easier. One example: I'm, I'm working with a company that is um, has a wonderful uh, Stanford uh, adjunct faculty member, a CEO. It's an energy-based company, uh, renewable energy company that hopefully will will really go gangbusters. Uh, called the GSL, Geothermic Solution, singular, and. This comp- the, the CEO is a wonderful guy, and, and, and sometimes he, he just, you know, he doesn't quite know what to do, and, and um, you know, there are lots of complications in the technology, in the approach, and, and also he needs to raise funds. And so p- part of my work is, I think, to just say, well, here's what I think you're saying. Is that clear? What, about, what, about the, what are the options here that we might explore, and let's pick a path and go, right? I mean, I, I think I, 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 I'm a sort of... In, in the true D-School sense, I have a bias to action, to getting things done. And um, I, I've, I've taken to heart my position and ability to, with through experience, to know how to get things done, <laughs> right? And to, to, to cajole and convince and, and push and nudge toward, toward action. While, while doing so, 
with respect to the values of the organization that I happen to be working for, whatever that is, or and or the, the mission and vision of, of, of the opportunity and, and make sure that we are doing things in the right way. Bias towards action. That's the best way to learn, to integrate, to get better and to be more successful. I always have to end with something more personal. So you are a father of three, uh, 21, 21, and 19. How do you balance work and life or integrate them better? Are you, if I were to ask your wife, uh, how much score would she give you as a father or a husband uh, as compared with the CEO or the former um, associate vice provost, what would, it, what, she, what would she say? Well, I think... Uh, hopefully now my score would have gone up. Stanford, especially toward the end, was a difficult, difficult sledding. Um, uh, what, what, what? I think she would give me a reasonably good score in in this this time, uh, over these last maybe three years or so. I, I think, you know, trying to. One of the things that I do a lot, I, I work out almost every day. Um, part of that is to just clear my mind, but also part of it is uh, the old athlete in me trying to sort of... Baseball, re- right? Tr- right, trying, yeah. to, trying to relive the glory days and so on. <laughs> um, so so I, I think sort of people tend to focus on what potentially could be all-consuming. At Stanford, it was, was maybe too much all-consuming. Um, I, I feel like I have a good balance now in, in, in um, sort of my health. Um, I, I think family, uh, the, I value family time around meals in particular. I think we, um, my wife and I try to actually, we're, we, we really enjoy eating and cooking, and so we, I think we do a pretty good job there. And you know, looking forward very much to sort of the Thanksgiving holiday, although I'll could be coming back uh, fr- from a business trip just, just prior to that. But we'll, it'll, it'll be great. It'll be great to have a, a festive weekend and uh, enjoy the kids uh, who will be home and, and, and so on. So that, that's, um, I, I think that's how I might respond to the, to, to the sort of family question. Balance is tough. You got it. You, and you have each person has his or her own journey to figure out what, what works for them. But my, my focus has been also to, to be fairly protective of a component of self-care. Uh, and, and the way I do that is by, by uh, uh, exercise. Yes. So. I, live, I love what you said about relief, the past day glory. <laughs> <laughs> but you have a pretty good sense of figuring out what's important for you. And then you try to do things to adjust. Final question uh, to you. I think you alluded to this a little bit. How do you measure the success of your life? Yeah, I, I think I think a lot about impact, right? And and I and I think um, you know I was at the uh, the Davos in the desert Davos in the desert event, the FII, the the um, event that's it was in Saudi Arabia, and I I walk in the hallway and I saw Rauti Chehi, who was the former CEO of Eura Technologies, uh, the program in yes. Lille, and he, he just we gave each other a big hug and. That is what I think about impact, right? These relationships that go far beyond the sort of transactional activity. I, I mean, I think a lot about um, the, the impact that goes far beyond the transactional. We, we, had, we did a lot of great work. We had a lot of people that go through our program in Lille. Um, but the fact that he and I can connect after so many years and, you know, give each other a hug and then, um, you know, then say, hey, you know, could we get together for business or just to break bread uh, because we like each other. And th- I think that's... That's where I think, you know, and, and if I think about the connections that I've made all over the globe, I've, I've got friends most everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I think I'd, that that's something, you know, I, I would love to have people say that, you know, Paul, he made an impact. We, we got some really good stuff done and he's a pretty good guy. We had some fun. So, you know, that, that's sort of maybe how I would think about you know, my legacy. It's really about impact. There's a Chinese saying called Tao Li Man Tian Xia. So you plant the trees where the shades you will never sit in, but it's all over the globe and it's because of you and your work and your passion. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much.